Oh, I remember growing up here in Texas, and in my grade school years, sometimes people would ask me, are you a Catholic or are you a regular Christian? A rather funny question, perhaps a bit insulting, but it stems from the notion that here in the United States being Protestant is the norm and that Catholics are different or somehow divergent, while as the vast majority of people know or will learn, Catholicism as a religious institution far predates the Protestant blasphemers, or I mean Protestant believers. But arguably the oldest Christian branch in existence belongs not to the West, but to the East, as naturally since Jesus and his disciples lived in Israel, the oldest churches in the world can be found in the Eastern Mediterranean region. It only took a few hundred years after the crucifixion of Christ for the religion to spread throughout the Roman Empire, and as I've discussed in the past, many areas of the former Roman Empire such as Syria, Egypt, parts of the Maghreb, as well as most famously Anatolia, were all majority Christian by the year 300 AD. But maybe less famously, this old wave of Christianity also reached as far as Ethiopia, or Abyssinia as it was known, Socotra off the coast of Yemen, as well as small pockets in southern India before Islam completely swept through the region, conquering large swaths of the already weakened Byzantine and Persian empires, and the East-West Schism in 1054 is what cemented the differences between Western and Eastern Christianity, breaking off into the modern Catholic and Orthodox churches respectively. Effectively. The Nubians, a Nilo-Saharan ethnic group along the Upper Nile in Egypt and Sudan, were formerly one of the strongest powers in all of Africa, even briefly conquering the Afroasiatic Egyptians to their north in the 7th century BC. And it's a not so commonly known fact that the Nubian Kingdom of Kush was one of the first empires to officially adopt Christianity. However, subsequent waves of Islamic invasion gradually withered away at Kush until the kingdom fell and the Nubians were converted to Islam. Small relics of the former Orthodox Christian rule can be found throughout the region today, and although Islamic powers frequently attempted to conquer Abyssinia, they largely retained their Orthodox culture and religion. The hopes of any global pan-Orthodox country certainly died with the Byzantine Empire, but what if the modern practitioners of Orthodox Christianity in a fit of medievalism decided to create a neo-Byzantine Empire of sorts, uniting the entirety of the current Orthodox Christian world into a single country? This will be a little similar, but really not at all similar to my video over a potential pan-Slavic country, which would have similar borders to a pan-Orthodox country, but it's very important to realize not all Slavic ethnic groups are traditionally Orthodox, and not all Orthodox Christians belong to Slavic ethnic groups. In fact, not even close. Yeah, I know technically on my last pan-Islamic videos, you guys overwhelmingly requested a pan-Catholic country instead, and I will get to that eventually, but I really feel like the Orthodox Orthodox world has a lot more potential and wouldn't have quite so many logistical issues as a massive global Catholic hegemony, seeing as the Orthodox world is a bit more contained regionally. So what are the criteria for inclusion in this hypothetical country? Let's include areas that are majority Orthodox or at least nominally Orthodox, and we can include enclaves so long as they are not landlocked, meaning the core of the country would be located in northern Eurasia, clearly with Russia being the largest Orthodox country, and it would include their fellow Slavs of the Ukrainians and Belarusians, but also Romania, Greece, Cyprus, Bulgaria, and most of the former Yugoslavia, and in the east, the Caucasian nations of Armenia and Georgia would also be included. Egypt, which has one of the largest Orthodox populations in the world, known as Copts, can be divided up with the proportion of the country with the largest Christian population joining the new country, which isn't too much of a problem, but we would also have to shave down Ethiopia and Eritrea to this weird potato-shaped blob bordering the Red Sea, because, of course, the Orthodox world simply wouldn't be complete without an Abyssinian province. Additionally, let's include part of southeastern Alaska, seeing as when the Russians colonized Alaska in the 18th century, a large number of Aleutian and native Alaskan peoples converted to Eastern Orthodoxy, making it the only U.S. state with a native Orthodox population. Outside of this area and regions that would simply be untenable for incorporation, there are also Syriac Orthodox Christians in Iraq and Syria, the last remnants of the dwindling Assyrian homeland, as well as a few million other Syriac Orthodox Christians stranded in the state of Kerala in southern India, and of course the large diaspora of Eastern Europeans, Horn Africans, and Levantines all over the world who have brought their Orthodox Christian faith with them. 
But needless to say, this not quite so contiguous land area would still include the overwhelming majority of all practitioners of Eastern Orthodoxy and Oriental Orthodoxy, with Armenian, Egyptian, Eritrean, and Ethiopian members being Oriental, and all others being Eastern. Rather odd considering East and Orient are synonyms of each other. But all this stretching over 7.5 million square miles, or 19 million square kilometers, and I don't think you need me to tell you that that's a huge amount of land, with around 328 million people in the Orthodox world, slightly higher than the United States. Now, I know how unrealistic this scenario is, especially considering the demographics and politics of such a divided country, but just look at this as a sort of census over the Orthodox Christian world, which is considerably diverse, with no one ethnic group making up an overall majority, and seeing as to how the bulk of the territories in Europe, over 70% would be of European descent, mostly Slavic, but with considerable minorities of Romanians, not only in Romania, but also in neighboring Moldova and Ukraine, along with Greeks, who have historically been the main progenitors of the Orthodox Christian community, and have ancient communities scattered throughout the Mediterranean and Black Sea regions. A considerable minority, over 12%, would be of Horn African descent, a group that can easily be distinguished from other Africans by culture, language, and appearance, with most being of Habesha origin, that being the Amhara and Tigrinya, and another large proportion, around 7%, are of Coptic or Egyptian Arab descent, although sometimes Copts may identify as Arabs, since they no longer speak the Old Coptic language as a first language, which descended from ancient Egyptian. The remainder are mostly Turkic or Uralic tribes in the Ural mountain range, Romani, who may or may not be Orthodox Christians, and a very small minority who are Siberian or Native American. As for the official language of such a diverse empire, it would definitely be difficult to decide for sure, seeing how if Russian were to be the official language, it would honestly just seem like a neo-Soviet empire rather than an Orthodox empire. Overall, the majority in the Orthodox world speak either a Indo-European or Afro-Asiatic language, but from a historic standpoint, Latin or Greek would certainly seem appropriate since these were the languages of the late Byzantine Empire, but perhaps Old Church Slavonic could be codified since this was the language that was standardized by the Byzantine missionaries in order to Christianize the Slavic peoples in the 9th century AD. As mentioned, although Egyptian Christians no longer speak the Coptic language in everyday interactions as a first language, it is still used in religious ceremonies as a liturgical language, so if there was some semblance of autonomy for the Coptic people, perhaps there could be some sort of linguistic revival for the Coptic language, similar to what happened with Hebrew in modern Israel. One of the primary linguistic issues of such a country would not only be language, but the very script by which they write, as in the Orthodox world there are numerous numerous inscriptions in which the various languages are written, at least eight, all of which are derived from the old Phoenician alphabet thousands of years ago. Now, the majority of people know that most Slavic languages are written in the Cyrillic script, and Romanian is generally transcribed in the Latin alphabet, and that Greek has always had its own unique alphabet, but there are many other unique scripts used to transcribe languages spoken in the Orthodox Christian world. The Mingrelian languages spoken in the Caucasian Republic of Georgia are written in a uniquely beautiful script, and Armenian also has its own script. Although, I don't know, everything kind of just looks like the letter U to me. Coptic Orthodox Christians of course use the Arabic script, although the Coptic alphabet was formerly used, which bears a strong resemblance to the Greek alphabet, and in much of the Horn of Africa, the Ge'ez script is used, which actually dates back over a thousand years. Now, because of the dominance of communism in Eastern Europe for decades in the 20th century, Orthodox Christianity was heavily repressed by the government, and for a while, the Eastern Bloc was known as some of the most atheistic places in the world. However, most areas of the former Eastern Bloc saw a huge spike in religious adherence after the fall of the USSR, including most of the Eastern Orthodox world. And even though some places like Armenia or Romania saw a near universal return to organized religion, over 90% in both countries, in Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia, there is still a very large irreligious minority, or maybe majority, depending on who you talk to. In this hypothetical Orthodox country, though, undoubtedly the bulk would belong to the Eastern Orthodox denomination, or nearly 48%, who would outnumber members of the Oriental Orthodox Church 3 to 1, and a small minority of 3% belong to the other Christian branches of Catholicism and Protestantism. 
Due to their proximity to the Islamic world, there is obviously a large minority of Muslims in the Orthodox world at nearly 10%, including Tatars, Kazakhs, and other Turkic groups in Russia, as well as Arab Muslims in the Egyptian territory. And lastly, there is a small number of people who have reverted to the old Slavic pagan religions in Russia and Eastern Europe, with the remainder being irreligious. Now, hey, I know this scenario has been beyond unrealistic. I know there's no way that a highly nationalistic country like Russia would be willing to unite with all these countries, or that the Egyptian government would be cool with simply allowing a large chunk of its landmass declare independence for the Christian minority, and don't even get me started on the Crimea situation. But as always, these kinds of videos are an interesting look as a demographic snapshot of a unique region, and just a fun thought experiment. There's absolutely no way a direct democracy could work in such a diverse and non-contiguous country, so some sort of regional government or theocracy with a central authority would need to be established to unite all Orthodox peoples. As for the capital of such a gargantuan and diverse nation, perhaps Moscow? St. Petersburg? Sure. Athens? Why not? But honestly, I'd hedge my bets on Constantin. So go ahead and let me know your thoughts on this wacky and zany scenario. And of course, don't take the video too seriously. But for today's poll, let me know which Orthodox group you have the most interest in. And as always, this has been Mason. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'll see you next time.